When I met my wife and we got engaged to be married, I asked my wife, and I'm really not this demanding, but I said there, I said, there's one thing I want you to learn. I want you to learn to cook like my mother. I want you to get the same ingredients. I want you to use the same measurements. Uh, it, I, I, was, I took it to, you know, we're talking so much about levels in the church. I took it to another level. I said, I want you to go see what kind of pots and pans my mother has. Find the brand. Let's go to service merchandise and let's get the same pots and pans that my mother has. I, I, wanted, to know what, I wanted to know what measuring uh, spoon she was using. I, I wanted to know if my mother cooked on electric or gas because if she cooked on electric, we were not going to cook on gas. I wanted it to taste exactly the way it tasted when I I went home and I'll never forget that first time we went grocery shopping and we're in we're, we're in the grocery store and we're fill, we don't have anything in our apartment yet and we filled up the shopping cart we've gotten a second cart and we're filling things up and I just happened to look in the cart and she had a salt shaker and it said salt all over I said what's that she said what well, salt I said that's not the kind of salt my mother uses I said that we don't I said I want the salt with the lady and the, she's walking and the salt's falling behind and she got an umbrella. I said, get the one with the umbrella because this says salt, but I don't know what it tastes like. I want the one with the umbrella. And then we went to look at the pepper and she got one of these complicated pepper shakers where you gotta, you gotta work. I don't like to work for food. I don't eat lobster. I don't work. I don't need anything that you need a hammer for. I just want to be able to bite. And, and she gets, you have to grind. I, it, you know, there's red and brown and black balls. I said, where's the pepper? Just buy red. We, we have enough money. The Lord's, but we can buy the ground stuff. I mean, just go ahead and get just good old black pepper. We can do it, but make sure it's the one with the lady and the umbrella. I, I wanted it to taste exactly the same because I know what tastes good and I know what doesn't taste good. And I knew that I wanted her to duplicate what my mother had already taught me that taste good. And that's how I feel about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and what I want to talk to you tonight about. I love this church. I was brought up in this Pentecostal way. I was brought up in the things of God. I love being part of a church that believes in the power of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and signs, miracles, and wonders. I like being a part of a church that knows how to pray and a church that knows how to prophesy and a church that knows how to praise and a church that knows how to worship. And when I look back and I think about how do you build a church that has power and how do you build a church that has revival we go back to the book of acts and when i go to the book of acts i find a church that knows how to pray and knows how to prophesy and how to consecrate and loves holiness and loves the power of god and that's the kind of church i still want to be a part of in 2013 and the, the, you know there's this there, there there's a modern church today that wants the power of the old church but doesn't want to pray like the old church and they want to prophesy without the required consecration and they want to prophesy reward without a prophet's price and they want authority to speak in the spirit but not let the spirit speak back to them and you you know there's a lot of problems in the church today I, I, I recognize that but uh, but with all of the problems that exist in the church I come to ask you humbly today because I have complained a lot about what's going on in the church and I've preached and talked a lot about what's happening in the church and things that really trouble me and the Lord came and visited me and spoke to me and he said Tony when has there not been problems in the apostolic church when has there not been problems in this walk when has there not been issues going on and he sent me back to the book of acts which i say that i've read a million times he made me read it a million and one times and so i went to acts chapter one and they're choosing a man to replace judas who had to kill himself because he betrayed the master and they chose a man named matthias and you never read about him again then we get to acts chapter two and everybody's calling him crazy and drunk you get to acts chapter three peter and john are on their way to church find a lame man sitting at the door they heal him the bible says that five thousand are saved and their honorarium for the day is to spend the night in prison you get to acts chapter five and ananias and sapphira try to give less than what they're supposed to give and they attempt to lie to the holy ghost and to the man of god and they die yet a few verses later in verse 12 it says that sent many signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostle their reward for that day is that after everybody had been sick they and everybody had been healed they were sent to jail 
fail again. But there were so many healings and so many sick getting healed. Nobody even bothered going to church. They just threw them in the streets and just let the shadow pass by. And they're arrested and they're beaten for preaching the message. And then you come to Acts chapter 6. If there hasn't been enough problems in the church already, you come to Acts chapter 6, one of the most critical moments in the early history of the church. Because the Bible says in that days the numbers of disciples multiplied and so did the murmuring. I thought growth solved murmuring. I thought that if you had revival, the gossip would go away. I am a fool. Because Acts chapter 6 says that they weren't adding, they were multiplying, and so was the murmuring amongst the saints. There's gossip, there's problems, there's issues, and it's not because of a curse, it's because of a blessing. They're so blessed that they're complaining about the blessing. They're so blessed that nobody had to preach on stewardship. Nobody had to teach on tithing. We didn't have to have a six-part series with books and handouts and PowerPoints, and you take a little string and tie it around your finger and commit that you're going to tithe for 60 days, and if nothing happens, we're going to give you the tithe. There was nothing like that in the book of Acts. If you go to the book of Acts chapter 2, they were just selling everything and giving it to the church. There was no money problem. They were so well financed that they could give to the orphans and to the widows. It was a generously giving church. And they were receiving more money and more blessing and having more revival and yet at the same time having more murmuring and backbiting because even though they were blessed, now there was complaints about who was receiving more. The apostles can't handle anymore. They can't preach. They can't prophesy. They can't pray. They say, we need to choose some other people to go take. You, you go, Stephen, you go serve the tables. And then you come to Acts chapter 7. He did such a good job serving the tables that he's killed in Acts chapter 7. And then you, there's 28 chapters, but blessed be the name of the Lord, there's only time to talk about 10 tonight. You get to Acts chapter 8, and a future apostle and minister of the gospel turns out to be one of those that had conspired to kill Stephen. And later on, you find a con man named Simon who saw that through the laying on of hands, power was transmitted, and he wanted to know how much could he buy that for. Then you get to Acts chapter 9, and you find Saul of Tarsus, who was part of the reason why Stephen was put to death, and he has an encounter with Jesus on the road, and he turns from his ways, and he converts, so much so that he changes his name to Paul, and he's so converted that nobody can believe it. They said, there is no way that this man has changed. I know you. The Jews have such a hard time accepting his conversion that they decided that he's a fake and that they're going to kill him. Then you get to Acts chapter 10, and there's this man that's humble and that fears the Lord named Cornelius. And God is going to reveal truth to him and brings Peter uh, and sends Peter to preach. And Peter doesn't want to go because he says he's unclean. I'm not going to preach to him. He's a Gentile. I don't have time to get to all the other 18 chapters, but you get the point. There have always been problems in the church. There have been changes in leadership. There has been gossip. There has been grumbling, grumbling. There have been money issues. There has been complaining. There has been division. There has been murder. There has been death. But don't get so caught up in the criticism of the church that you don't finish reading the chapters to see that all by it there was problems and there was issues and all kinds of things that even though that was all going on, the gates of hell never were able to prevail against the church because while the problems were going on, miracles, signs, and wonders, and salvation, and revival was taking place at the same time. It is written, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Will there be an attack? Yes. Will there be some problems? Yes. But it's not going to prevail against the church. And I came to say tonight, thank God for the church. I love the church. Can you say amen? Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail prevail. We are in what is the most powerful force on the face of the earth when we are inside of the body of Christ. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and of the prophets, which is Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's our foundation. That's why we can't be knocked down. That's why I'm not worried about the church. I was worried, but I'm not worried any longer. I know there's problems. I know there's some that don't represent us well, but I can't do anything about them. I can only take care about me and I've decided I'm going to be 
be the best light that there can be. I've decided I'm going to be the best salt there can be. I'm going to be the best representation of the church because if this world is going to be saved, it needs a power, Holy Ghost filled church. Would you clap your hands and praise the Lord? I want to be like the church of the book of Acts that could fight and go through trials and go to jail and still see thousands get saved, be falsely accused, be tortured, but the sick would still get healed. The kind of movement and reviving, revival can't happen without the power of the Holy Ghost. Peter and John and those that preached, they knew that if they were going to have what, they, what the Lord had promised to them, they had to preach the Holy Ghost and fire. Everyone needs the Holy Ghost. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. Four out of five pastors don't recommend it, and if they did, it wouldn't matter because you need to have the Holy Ghost working inside of your life. It's not enough to just say, I joined the church. You need to be joined to Christ in baptism, and you need to be baptized from on high with the power of the Holy Ghost. You need to speak in other tongues. You need to prophesy, and if you've never done it before, you need to pray with us tonight so that you leave out of here a tongue talker just like us. You need this power.